Hello, it's Scott Manley here. The Titan rocket is one of the most famous launch vehicles in US space history. During its long career, it would launch several world-famous spacecraft to other planets and many, many more classified spacecraft for the US military. Before this, the Titan was conceived as a ballistic missile designed to lob uh, nuclear warheads between continents during the Cold War. This all began in October of 1955, when the US Air Force created the Titan ICBM program. The Air Force was already developing the short-range Thor and the longer-range Atlas, but the Titan was going to be more ambitious still, using a proper two-stage rocket instead of Atlas's stage-and-a-half approach. It was more ambitious, but by betting on multiple approaches, they maximized America's chance of developing a viable missile system. So the Titan name, of course, refers to the Titans of Greek mythology. These are the predecessors to the Olympian gods. In fact, the Titan Cronus, who was the child of Uranus, he was also the father of Zeus. Uh, so anyway, yeah, the Titan, it all started as a series of studies into alternative components, and eventually this evolved into a full-fledged program with Martin, the company founded by Glenn L. Martin as the prime contractor. So the Titan missile design was significantly different from the Atlas. Instead of you know, using Atlas's you know, mass-saving pressurized balloon construction, the Titan was a much more traditional, conventional aircraft-like structure. The vehicle would end up to be about a, you know, six tons of mass uh, with about 100 tons of propellant, 3.1 meters in diameter, about 31 meters tall. Just over half of the length was the first stage. The second stage was a bit narrower. It was only 2.3 meters in diameter. So the Titan would then end up having a higher dry mass than Atlas, but a lower wet mass with a bigger payload. And this was because Titan was a proper two-stage vehicle. So both stages were powered by Aerojet General engines burning kerosene and liquid oxygen. Stage one would use a two-chambered uh, LR87AJ1 engine, which had a thrust of 190 tons. Uh, the nozzles were able to gimbal individually to provide yaw, pitch, and roll control. Stage two relied on a single LR91 engine that produced 36 tons of thrust, and the turbo pump exhaust would be exiting through four gimbaled vernier nozzles so that it could provide roll and control for the upper stage. Now, every version of the Titan actually used the LR87 and the LR91, and these engines would evolve over the years, increasing in power and transitioning to new propellants. So test flights began in 1959. The first four launches were all successful, but these were using dummy second stages. Once they started testing the full Titan I, they had a number of setbacks. On, in May of 1959, the first stage exploded during a static test, with a similar te incident occurring in July of 1959 as well. In August, they had the first attempt to launch the two-stage missile with a dummy warhead, and a faulty release mechanism let the rocket light rise early, and then the engine shut down, causing the entire rocket to fall back onto the launch pad and explode. In December of 1959, Stage 1 exploded just above the pad due to an accidentally triggered range safety uh, destruct system. But eventually, the Titan 1 would demonstrate ranges of over, over 6,000 miles, and that would let it be deployed as an active ballistic missile from 1962 to 1965. The payload would be an Avco Mark IV re-entry vehicle containing that all-important W33 thermonuclear bomb with a yield of 3.5 megatons. Titans, in fact, would carry the largest warheads in the US missile arsenal. So the Titan was the first ICBM to deploy, be deployed in underground silos, but the limited technology of the era did leave it poorly suited to the role. The Titan I used cryogenic propellants, and so it needed to be loaded just before launch, and that took about 15 minutes. Then it would be raised above the ground for the launch, and that would take another seven minutes to go up. And the missile also used radio guidance from the ground, which needed to be calibrated, lock onto the vehicle and everything, and it could only provide guidance for one rocket at a time. So this was not a rapid response system. Before it was even deployed into service, the US was already working on its successor, the Titan II. 
First, the propellant was switched over to storable hypergolic propellants, dinitrogen tetroxide in a mix of hydrazine and UDMH, known as aerozine 50. Uh, the missile could then be kept permanently loaded with propellant. The LR87 and LR91 engines would get new variants to support the new propellants. The stages were redesigned. The first stage was now longer and the second stage was the same width as the first stage. So the Titan II massed about 150 tons, almost 50% increase in the mass. Titan II began test launches in 1962 and by 1963 it entered service, replacing the Titan I completely by 1965. And the Titan II would continue to operate as an ICBM in the US arsenal until 1987. Now, while the early Thor and Atlas missiles would be repurposed as space launch vehicles, the Titan I never had this honour, and all of those were eventually uh, retired and scrapped. With the, I think there's one in a museum. The Titan's evolution to become a space launch vehicle would start with Gemini, or Gemini as they said. In collaboration with NASA, the Gemini launch vehicle was a modestly enhanced version of the Titan II. It carried a little more fuel in the first and second stages. It had a whole lot of new avionics and sensors, redundant systems, and of course, a human-rated spacecraft on top. It would launch 12 times from 1964 to 1966, 10 of those with crew on board. Around the same time, the Titan III debuted, turning Titan into a proper launch vehicle. The structure was strengthened to handle higher loads from the upper stages and side-mounted boosters. There was a bit more room again for propellant and some of the missile hardware like retro rockets and the onboard inertial guidance were removed to make room for the uh, ground-based guidance. Now, the first version to fly was the Titan 3A, and this was more a test bed. It added a new third stage called the Trans Stage. This was powered by a pair of AJ-10-138 engines, and it massed about 12.5 tons when fueled. This was intended to enable uh, Titan to launch geostationary satellites. So the Titan 3A was like a short-lived test vehicle basically to test the trans stage. It launched four times in 1964 and 1965, with three of those attempts actually being successful. 1965 saw the debut of the Titan 3C, and this was the first operational Titan with the trans stage. This also added a pair of large US 1205 solid rocket motors. These are 226 motors, ton more motors, more than the Titan core, uh, and with the trans stage, the entire stack would mass over 600 tons. At launch, only the boosters would light. They would provide thrust vectoring through liquid injection into the nozzle. And after about 115 seconds, they would begin their burnout and the core stage would light and the boosters would separate. So this would be the most powerful launcher available to the US military, able to put three tons into geostationary orbit, and it would fly on into the 1980s, putting super secret payloads into geostationary orbit. The Titan 3B actually came later than the 3C, uh, it was in 1966, um, yeah, because lexical ordering of names rarely has any influence on their development schedules. The 3B, instead of the trans stage, it used the Agena D as the third stage, and this would launch from Vandenberg to put the KH-8 Gambit reconnaissance satellites into orbit. The Titan would replace the Atlas and the Thor, which had previously been doing these duties with the smaller keyhole satellites. So the other, next variant would be the 3D, and that was basically a 3C, but they removed the trans stage, and this was primarily used from Vandenberg to launch heavier payloads like the KH-9 and the KH-11 satellites into, sol into polar orbits, and this would live from about 1971 to 1982. Now the 3M, that was never actually flown, but it was important to the development. The M was for manned. It would be the launch vehicle that the Air Force wanted to use for their manned orbiting laboratory program. Spy satellites were pretty dumb at the time, and they had a habit of taking photos of clouds rather than interesting things on the ground. So the manned orbiting laboratory would put a crew on a space station with a big camera to take images, not only allowing them to avoid the clouds, but also to make snap decisions to capture other important things they might see in the process. So the 3M stretched the core and the boosters, with the core tipping the scales now at 180 tons at each seven second segment booster now 320 tons. 
the enlarged core would be used to upgrade the 3B. So the base 3B was now the 23B and the 24B with a, an enlarged core stage. And this was in, introduced in 1971. And the same year also saw the 33B and the 34B, which were used a larger fairing for payloads that needed it. So the 34B would be used up until 1987, still carrying those KH-8 photo reconnaissance satellites that still had to return film to Earth for development and analysis. But one of the most important versions of the Titan III was the Titan III-E, also known as Titan Centaur, and that replaced the trans stage with the higher performance Centaur. This would launch six historic scientific payloads, Helios A and B, Viking 1 and 2, and of course, Voyager 1 and 2. Uh, they could also use a Star 37 stage on top of the Centaur for Helios and Voyager launches to get even higher departure velocities. And of course, if you've heard about, uh, if you've seen the video of Michael Burke making his announcement timed to a rocket launch, that was a Voyager launch in a Titan. So anyway, now we get to the 1980s. While the Space Shuttle wanted to show that it could do all that military stuff, the Titan delivers a new and more performance version, the 34D. It used the larger core stages from the 34B, but it paired them with new six-segment solid boosters rather than the five-segment on the previous Titan 3s. Generally, the East Coast flights were to geostationary payloads, which also required the trans stage, but the West Coast flights were to low polar orbits and they didn't have the third stage. So now, late 1980s, the Titan II missiles are being decommissioned and some of these 20-year-old missiles were then converted into Titan II 23G launch vehicles, now by Martin Marietta. The avionics were upgraded, payload adapters were added, and an optional Star 37 third stage was integrated, and they made 13 launches with this, all from Vandenberg, carrying payloads for the Air Force, NASA, NOAA. Like, Clementine was one of the missions launched by this. It was a collaboration between the Strategic Defense Initiative and NASA, putting sensors in deep space to test their operation and using those sensors to investigate the moon. The Titan 223G would continue to operate and it would make its last launch in 2003, 40 years after the Titan II's first flight. Also at the end of the 80s, we had Commercial Titan, or CT-3. This is a variant developed to uh, deliver commercial satellites to geostationary orbit. Originally, it had been pitched to the Air Force, who were looking for a launch vehicle to pick up the slack from shuttle, but Delta II had won that contract. It took the 34D design and it stretched the second stage tanks and added a larger fairing. However, it was way more expensive than the competitors. In particular, Ariane. It only launched four times in 1990 to 1992. The second launch was Intelsat 603, which experienced a failure with its kick motor, leaving the satellite stranded in low Earth orbit. That satellite would be visited by Space Shuttle Endeavour on STS-49, allowing the crew to capture the satellite and install a new kick motor and send the spacecraft to its final orbit. And now we get to the Titan IV, and development of this actually began in the mid-1980s as the Air Force was looking for an expendable rocket to complement the Space Shuttle. Titan IV would use even larger 1207 solid rocket motors with seven segments. The core stage was stretched and two-third stages were offered depending upon the payload requirements. They could either use the solid inertial upper stage, which was flown on the Space Shuttle, and a new version of the Centaur, which was originally designed for the Space Shuttle but never flew. The Centaur G Prime became Centaur Titan. Uh, so yeah, notably, the Titan IV would have a fairing option, which would be as large as a shuttle's payload bay, allowing it to handle all those payloads which had originally been designed with a shuttle in mind, but the shuttle was too expensive for. The Titan IV would be used almost exclusively for the largest US military payloads, the KH-11 spy satellites, which share a lot of spacecraft DNA with the Hubble Space Telescope or the Orion Electronic Intelligence satellites in geostationary orbit. So in 1997, the Titan IV gained a new upgraded solid rocket motors from Alliant Tech Systems, and this enhanced the payload capabilities by about 25%. This upgraded version would now be known as Titan 4B, and the original Titan would now be retroactively named Titan 4A. 
So the 4B would launch the only non-military payload on the Titan IV, Cassini Huygens. The huge probe would spend years exploring the Saturnian system and make the most distant spacecraft landing in the history. During 1998 to 1999, Titan IV would go through something of a rough patch with three consecutive failed launches. The first was due to frayed wire short-circuiting and causing the guidance computer to reboot. The next was when a satellite failed to separate from the inertial upper stage. And the third was a Centaur which spun out of control due to a programming orbit and left the spacecraft in a useless orbit. But after that, Titan got back in shape and continued to fly into the 21st century. However, Titan's days were numbered. Martin Marietta had acquired General Dynamics in 1993 and they had inherited the Atlas rocket. Subsequently, they also merged with Lockheed to form Lockheed Martin. So, in the mid-90s, when Lockheed Martin bid on the Evolved Expendable Launch Vehicle contracts, its winning proposal centred on evolving Atlas into the Atlas V, and that is still flying today. Titan, with its old technology, with its expensive hypergolic propellant, made it one of the most expensive launch vehicles at the time, and EELV was all about cutting costs. Remember that commercial Titan III was a failure in the market, but Titan IV was supported by the deep pockets of the US military. That was coming to an end. So Atlas V, which was proposed, had a lower payload capabilities than the Titan, but at the time they were at the Atlas designers were still talking about Atlas V heavy in their roadmap, where they would basically take five, uh, sorry, three Atlas V cores and bond them together to make a bigger rocket. Uh, those could handle all the payloads that Titan uh, could, and therefore Titan wasn't needed anymore. Now, there had actually been some proposals for a Titan V, mainly focused on returning the core stages to using cryogenic propellant, like the Titan I. In fact, in Star Trek First Contact, uh, Zephram Cochran launches the Phoenix spacecraft on a Titan V. That movie was made in the 1990s, while the Titan IV was still the US's largest expendable launch vehicle. The final Titan II launch happened in 2003, and the final Titan IV went in 2005. Delta IV Heavy would end up taking over the big payloads, and the Titan launch pads now host Atlas V and Falcon 9 on both coasts. There's a few Titans on display around the US, but I think my favourite bit of Titan's legacy has to be the Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft in the depths of space, probably for billions of years to come. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.